All right, thanks for attending. Appreciate you coming in. Uh, I thought I was going to get a big, long intro, and I wanted to say apologies right off the bat. I am not Tony Robbins, so we will not be walking on coals and doing fun stuff like that. But we're going to do a pretty fun presentation. Going to give you some good red meat to use, and uh, we'll get to it. So that's me. My name is Brad Larson. I'm the uh, owner broker of Larson Properties in San Antonio, Texas. All my alphabet soup there. So the first thing you're going to ask yourselves is, why are you here? So the title... It's kind of a tongue-in-cheek title, 600 Homes is Easy. Yeah, right. So if you're in growth mode, you know that getting to that point is not as easy as it sounds, especially in a hot sales market. So you're going to be here today. We're going to learn new techniques to help you grow. We're going to find out what is so different about us. You want to find out how to hate us, right? Name of the title. Oh, they're just in a really good market. It was easy for them. You know, no worries. And they got lucky with their timing, right? So let's kick it off. Who is this guy? Who is this clown up on stage right now talking to you guys? So I'm the owner broker of this company in San Antonio. We started full-time property management in 2011. We manage roughly about 625 single-family homes right now and growing. Our average rents are over 1500 per month. Our annual revenue is over $2 million. So, not a bad start. The good stats, we got it out of the way. Thank you, thank you. So we got all that out of the way, let's get to you know, the, the better stuff. All right, so prior to getting into property management, I served in the military, did some time as a captain in the, in the Army. Thank you, thank you. I miss those days, because I used to have hair, believe it or not. Yeah, I miss those days, but that was a good start. Uh, I had a good time. This is a, a picture in South Korea. So the four captains and I. I went to a military school, so I got to have fun doing that. Got to learn how to do all kinds of uh, hazing, which was great. <laughs> so, give you some introductions on the family, because I'm going to get up here and show you some slides and show you some that I am a normal guy. I'm not just an axe murderer here. So, this is me and the family. We're at Disneyland. I absolutely hated it. Hated it. I'm not a big fan of Disneyland. That's my wife, Leah, and I. Those are my two kids, Drake and Cora. They're doing their Guadalupe River rafting thing with us. There's my dog. That's my dog, Daisy. Anybody who gets to come to my office gets to introduce themselves to Daisy. There she is again. Isn't she awesome? I'm telling you. Well, so what I like to do for fun, this is uh, San Diego. We like to travel. This is me doing some fishing, right? That's not a bad little trout. Pretty good. Nothing like what Mr. Breen catches in South Florida. We are Cowboys fans, so try not to throw stuff at me. Dallas Cowboys. There's my vehicle. I drive a truck, so now you know I'm normal. I'm just your regular old hillbilly redneck. I love to play baseball, except I got inflicted with this weird disease called OLD, which means you're getting old. So I've had to kind of retire from playing baseball, but, you know, I still love it. And, of course, I love beer. All right. Round of applause for that, huh? Huh? Okay. Now you know I'm normal. Okay, great. Let's get on to it. We built a company in over 600 homes in five years. It's all organic growth. No acquisitions, all one and two kitchen table presentations. We're currently adding roughly 25 homes a month, every month, with a goal of 300 for this year. Kind of lofty, but I think we can achieve it. And we're generating over 200 in revenue per home per month. $200 in revenue per home per month, okay? That's a lot of the bottom line is how much money you're generating, because door count necessarily doesn't mean much. Uh, I could be on a slight crusade to if you're in a conversation with somebody and they say, oh, how many homes you manage? How many doors you manage? It should be a two-fold question. One, okay, tell them how many homes you manage. And two, what's your revenue? Because if you can manage half the homes or twice the revenue, isn't that what we all want? That's part of why you're here. All right, it gets better. Come on, cheer up a little bit. All right, I don't want to see you sleeping. Oh, don't be falling asleep on me. What we're going to learn today is some of the key trigger points in growth. What we did right and what we did wrong, we're going to air some dirty laundry. Staffing and company organization. This is always going to be a challenge. As you grow, you have to continually reorganize yourself. Marketing and reputation management. I got some golden nuggets in there for you. Just wait. Team incentives and retention. We'll talk about that. And important metrics and your exit strategy. That's always good to keep in mind and always plan for. All right, another one. You're going to get used to memes. I'm a meme person. I love them. One to simply not cheer up. Right? We're in Vegas, it's Monday morning, so here we are. 
what we're going to learn, some tips, some lessons learned, and some golden nuggets. Should be fun stuff. Okay, you have to implement what you learn. I'm a big fan of this, right, Mr. Brain? Thank you. Use your brain. Take notes and review them. Take written notes. I like written notes because you can take a note and look up at the same time. Take written notes. Trade ideas about notes before leaving. Find somebody at your table. Sit down Tuesday, Wednesday, tonight, whenever. Trade ideas. Trade notes. It's going to help you. Identify, prioritize, and account for those. Identify what you want to do. Prioritize which things you want to implement and account for that. Give yourself a 30 to 60 day, 90 window to get those things done that you want to do. And implement one thing no matter what out of here. I'm going to help you walk away with at least a couple golden nuggets out of here so you can walk out of this feeling pretty good. Go back to where you are and implement. All right, pop quiz. Who's ready? Who's excited? How many have a written growth plan? How many have a written growth plan for this year? On a bar napkin or whatever. It's good stuff. Commit to a written growth plan. It could be something as simple as saying, I want to grow with a net of 50 homes. It could be that simple. Doesn't have to be a big, long mission statement. Doesn't have to be a, you know, a whole big, long, giant ordeal, five page written out. Just one little tidbit. Because can you recognize when change is required? And is your staff actively resisting growth? Two questions you want to ask yourself. Can you recognize when change is coming? And is your staff actively or even passively resisting growth? Are they forgetting to call that owner back? Are they not that enthused on the phone when they take a phone call from a new owner? Ask yourself those questions. Okay, growth is the pits. And I stole this from the Australians. I'll give them credit at the end. Growth is people making key hires. As you get bigger, you have to make key hires. Incentives, finding incentive benefits for all the duty positions that you create. Somehow incentivize them. I'll go through a couple things here with you guys on how I would recommend you incentivize your team. Time, you have to devote the time to develop and prospect. You have to prospect. You have to prospect. Systems, develop the system to handle the growth. Now your systems are going to be continually updating, changing, evolving. They're always going to be, you know, my GM who hates it says we're always being changing, always be changing because we have to. As you grow, you have to evolve and get better. And I did steal this from Bob Walters from Leading Property Managers of Australia. So we give them credit. Okay, I keep this on my desk in my office, this little dump truck and Legos that we built, my son and I. I want to test this theory in your office. So if 50 new management agreements walk in today, how's your team going to react? Are they going to groan and say, oh man, I got to do more work, no thank you? Or are they going to say, woohoo, let's go, bring it on? That could be the litmus test for your office and, and what, your level, what your growth level could be. Keep that in mind. That's why I keep that dump truck there, and I did steal that one from the Australians too. They, they had a great idea, and my son and I had a good time building it, and I'm a Lego fan, so what? If you build it, they will come. Focus energy and resources on growth to find new owners. Okay, you have to really focus on this stuff. You cannot just sit back and hope that they come at you. You have to commit to it. Create and offer exceptional points of difference. We're going to continually talk about this stuff. You want to create points of difference. You want to keep creating points of difference. This is what sets you apart from your competitors in your market. Our phases of growth. Now, this is, this is pretty generic, and I just kind of rounded the numbers. I mean, the first 100, the less, less than 100 single-family homes under management was, fa was startup phase. Our mid-level phase, we changed a bunch of different times because it's very difficult as you add more staff and figure out which procedures are going to be best for you. And then our long-term growth phase is 400 plus to infinity. Okay, we'll, we'll get past this pretty quick. We grew from a home office with zero homes under management. We used new technologies to include video, video and software. Video is big. You're going to hear me talk a lot about video. Can't stress it enough. Uh, I'm going to go give you some golden nuggets as well in this. All right, some of the tips. Establish points of difference, as I mentioned, and lessons learned. Pick the right software and stick with it. Pick the right software and stick with it. We had one software prior to what we're using now, and the process to change is painful and expensive. So you're better off to stick with uh, whatever software you have now and make it work for you. 
because the grass is always greener, but let me tell you from after switching and after talking with long conversations with other property manager company owners about switching, the grass is not always greener. So stick with what you got and make it work. Okay, the San Antonio, Texas market, just to give you some background, rebounding from the 08 recession, home sales were slow. The market was ready for somebody with a new face and new techniques, so that was good. There's always room for that in almost every market. Some of the tips, videos equals search engine optimization, which equals leads. That's what the equation is. Videos equal leads. Take out the search engine optimization. That's a byproduct of doing good videos. What opportunities exist in your market? You have to reflect inward and look around you to see what is going to be out there that you can exploit, create points of difference, and build. What we did, we created extra points of difference as we, as we mentioned. I just listed a few on the website. So there's owner points of difference, we have tenant points of difference, and this is on the front page of the website. So you want to continually be creating those and telling people about it. Okay, you gotta tell people about your points of difference. Why are you different? You know, you should be ready with a 30 to 60 to 90 second elevator pitch to say, why are you different? Why should I hire you? Be ready with that. Don't have to be canned, but you can say, well, you know what? We do this better and we do this better, we do this better. It may not be better, but the non micro managers out there, I would challenge you, you need to be better at least by them. Okay, did I go too fast? Saw a lot of pictures. We'll get to that. Golden nugget time. Automate your form signing. And we used EchoSign. So how does that work? So step one, you create a widget. You put it on your website. For example, our 595 cleaning service, which means we'll go in and do the maids and the carpet cleaning for $595. We'll cover it all. But how does somebody sign up for that? Do you want them to walk into your office or do you want them to sign up at 2 in the morning on your website? We wanted them to sign up at 2 in the morning so we could deal with it. So this is just a couple of tidbits of how to do that, step one and step two. Okay, another golden nugget. Automate the lease cycle. I could spend a lot of time talking about this, and I'm a big believer in it. Because where we're going in the industry is very similar to Airbnb, and it's very similar to VRBO, vacation rental by owner. Tenants, millennials, do not want to come to your office. They do not want to do paper applications. They want an easy leasing process. Okay, so you have to figure out a way for somebody to lease a home from you without ever coming to your office. We have this perfected in our office. A tenant never has to come to our office. Never. Not at lease inception, not at the end of the lease. And how do they do that? We do everything electronically. Very simple online applications. Not a challenge. Everybody has the software out here to do that. Online applications, as I mentioned, electronic signatures, DocuSign, right? EchoSign, do electronic signatures. I know some people are going to say, well, I want my tenants to come into the office. I want to sit down with them. I want to hug. I want to sing Kumbaya. I don't want to do that because you're practicing law. You're asking your staff to practice law because the tenant's going to ask you, well, what does this paragraph mean? And any interpretation you give them right or wrong is the act to me of practicing law. You're, you're being legal aid at that point. Don't give legal advice. If you do electronic signatures, they can read, 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 read at their own pace, sign it, and they're done. And they're beautiful documents when they're done. You know, the DocuSign is phenomenal. I really, really like it. Then, the electronic payments. How do they deliver the security deposit? Wire, folks. Think of wires. Let them spend the 15 bucks with their bank to wire that security deposit or whatever funds you require to your bank accounts. You use a wiring system. Of course, you want to do electronic payments, you know, other ways, but there's a risk of doing ACH bounces because everybody knows an ACH is similar to a, a written paper check. It can bounce too, right? So we do the wires and or we just do, you know, certified funds. They can still come to the office and give us certified funds. But a lot of the, a lot of the folks that we rent to, they're from different markets, okay? They don't, they don't have the opportunity to to come and meet with us, to bring us all the stuff, because they might come for a weekend, do a few tours of some homes, do an online application on Sunday afternoon, and then they gotta go back to their home. So they gotta finalize the lease process from a distance. And the beautiful thing here is they can do lockbox move-ins. They can roll right into town, access through the lockbox, and get right into the home. Just like with a vacation rental by owner, just like with an Airbnb, and that's what the market's wanting. That's what your tenants want. Oh, by the way, could you monetize this? Hint, 
You know, back in the day, lockbox move-ins, could that be like a Disney Fast Pass? Would you pay more to do a lockbox move-in? Come meet me on Friday afternoon in San Antonio traffic. Good luck with that. Okay. A lot of people are going to pay for that convenience to go straight to the home, get access through a lockbox, through a code, through a dumb lockbox, through a code box, through Rently, through ShowMojo, all those other means have lockboxes out there. Figure out a way to allow them to move in through a lockbox. They're going to love you for it. They're going to love you for it. Okay, it's going to save your team a lot of headache. Who remembers the old Friday afternoon, 1 o'clock, you have, we even set appointments. We used to set appointments for tenants. Be here Friday afternoon, 1 o'clock to pick up your keys. And what do they do? They call you at 345 and say they're stuck in traffic and can't get to your office. So who's going to stay behind to wait for your tenants so they can move in? Is that going to be you? Is that going to be one of your staff members who's going to hate you for it? So allow this at all costs. Uh, I want to thank Dave Holt for teaching me this because he showed me the way to do this, and he's been doing it for 15 years. Okay, what we did wrong. Here's the, here's the dirty laundry time. Owners have my mobile number. Duh. <laughs> you know, I want to bang my head against the wall for doing that. But uh, as I was talking to a new guy the other day, he's over in Houston just starting up, I said, whatever you do, just set up a VOIP phone right now. Go spend 30 bucks a month, get some you know, business phone line number thing, and you can forward that to your cell phone, you can have an automated prompt, because all you're doing is training your owners. All you're doing is you're training them to call you on the weekend, on a Sunday morning, say, I just had a quick question about my owner statement. Well, guess what? When you don't answer the phone, you are, insert expletive here, and they're mad at you. Okay, even if you say, you know, I'll answer phone calls between Monday through Friday from 8 to 4. You can say that in your voice message, but when they call you and they want to get you and they get your voicemail, they're just irritated. So all you're doing is training your owners to do that. Okay, so I'd set it up to where you never have your mobile phone. I started with a templated website, and I don't necessarily agree with them. There are a lot of good vendors here at NARPM that do those types of websites. But at the end of the day, all that really matters is SEO. I'm going to talk about that more. But I had a templated website, and it didn't, didn't work. You know, I had a good friend of mine call me up and say, hey, man, you're sandboxed. You're like off the radar. You're, you're like on page 10. And I freaked out, okay, because I had a templated website that got hacked. And having a templated website from providers that give you a thousand different templated websites, but then they're also providing those thousand websites to 10,000 customers, I don't necessarily think Google's going to like that. Would you agree with me? Would you agree that Google wants customized, personalized stuff? That's what I think. We spent lots of money on pay-per-click ads with no real way to track it and no real way to figure out if it was doing any good. So we wasted a lot of money on that. If you're going to do a pay-per-click ad campaign, which I do like, I would recommend you monitor the heck out of them. I mean, really watch them like a hawk, okay? We made bad hires. So, as I've always joked, there's two types of employers. Those that make bad hires and those that lie about it. Which one are you? I've always made bad hires. I could tell story after story, but I think my GM is going to start throwing stuff at me if I do that. Probably, you know, scream at me and say, HR jar, HR jar. You know, like a swear jar. In my office, I have a HR jar. So don't make bad hires. Of course, you're going to. I've made them. We all do. And of course, IRS screw ups, right? I am not in jail, but the screw ups I've made with the IRS are pretty nominal. But they are things that you just, again, <clears throat> you just want to bang your head against the wall. Why did I not file that tax return for the LLC I started in November of 2013? Right? Bad, bad. Bang, bang, bang. Okay, here's another hot one. Create a content-filled website. Content-filled website. What does that mean? Video, blogs, good stuff. Because this is what people are doing out there. Oh, goodness, I finally found you. And when they get to your website, is it impressive? I don't care what it looks like, necessarily, but is it just a calling card with your name and your, your phone number on there? Or is it going to actually have some content on there, some good stuff, some real meat? WordPress or custom platforms I really like. I like WordPress a lot. So does Google. If you get a good webmaster that can help you develop a good WordPress website, that's gold. That really is. Of course, there's other custom platforms out there. I just happen to think WordPress works for us. Because search engine optimization is the only goal. doesn't matter what your website looks like necessarily if you're getting to the top of Google. Which one would you prefer? I'd rather be at the top of Google every time. You're the top of the pins. 
the website, as far as it, if it doesn't look as perfect as it should, you can still make it work. Okay, more lessons learned. Find solid bookkeeping services. Outsource if needed. So what do I mean by that? Everyone probably has a bookkeeper. You might even have an in-house bookkeeper that costs a lot of money. We decided to outsource our books a long time ago. And a little tidbit I'd recommend is outsource your personal books. Outsource your personal books to that bookkeeper. So come tax time, you file your returns. It's one data dump from your CPA, your bookkeeper, to your CPA with your personal books and your company books. So it makes it a lot easier. So I'd recommend that. That's a strong lesson learned. Pick the right management software and know how to use it. We talked about that. Become an excellent marketer of your services. So I used to sell homes before getting into this. I started in 03, sold some homes, you know, with Keller Williams, you know, all that good stuff. You have to become an excellent marketer of your services as you would your homes. If you can't market your services, how are you going to market your homes? Think about that, right? You set the right tone with your tenants and owners up front, as I was talking about. If you tell your owners you're going to be a 24-7 property management company, you'll have to be. That's what they will expect. So set the right tone up front with them. Tell them you have regular office hours. Tell them you can be reached here. Tell them you respond to emails within a day or two. Kind of set those expectations up front with your owners so they don't beat you up later on, because they will. All right, the mid-level phase. We got to 100 plus homes. Watch out. Chuck Norris time. 100 plus homes, we hired a critical, critical person to our staff who was a good general manager. I think that's when you have to make, make that hire. A good general manager at 100, 150, 100 homes, you gotta find somebody that can run the day-to-day -day operations without you being there. Because you may have to go out and run the business or build the business. All right, you want somebody to run it, you have to build it. Monitor mostly the service levels. And we're gonna talk more about how to do that but I'm a big believer in monitoring what you're doing out there. And that could be with the number of complaints coming in, what your owners are talking about, what your tenants are talking about. You have to get your pulse on the business, which you but you have to monitor that closely. And I'm going to show you some techniques. Some of the tips. The net promoter score. You know, this has been one of those, those buzzwords that's out there right now, the net promoter score, you know, how to, how to do that. Well, we've built a couple of those. So we can actually quantify the pulse of our company, what the mood is with our owners and what the mood is with our tenants. And so have we all seen the surveys that say, on a scale of one to 10, how likely are you to recommend Larson Properties? Right, we've all seen that potentially. Well, that's what we are putting out. And we're putting it out to the owners and tenants. I'm gonna show you some of the key points. Grow in spurts, figure out that growth to your business, perfect it, maintain it, and then grow some more, right? It's almost like a staircase. You gotta grow a little bit, perfect it, grow, perfect, and hopefully that's a hockey stick for you, but at some point you have to kinda step back a little bit and say, okay, we gotta you know, adjust fire here and figure out exactly how to maintain this growth. All right, it's joke time, who's ready? Sit down, sir, I'll get to it. The sun doesn't set, it just hides from Chuck Norris. Who likes that one? Okay, nobody, good. How many push-ups can Chuck Norris do? All of them. Okay, I'm gonna hide from the tomatoes being thrown. You guys are a tough crowd. Who knows this guy? Hire a business development manager. That's one of the key things, a mid-level phase you need to do. Hire somebody to help you do the business development. Because you, the owner, might be a great salesperson, but when you start wearing multiple hats, something has to suffer. So if you want to grow, I would highly recommend getting a business development manager. You want to hire a salesperson. Do not take a converted realtor necessarily and make them into a business development person. There's a lot to that. Salespeople are different. Realtors, they have a stigma that they know everything because I was a realtor, I am a realtor. We're all realtors. You know, we always have a joke in the office that we don't want to rent to two types of people. We don't want to rent to attorneys, we don't want to rent to realtors. That's a joke, jeez, joke, <laughs> joke. Because they tend to know everything. So that's why we like a salesperson. You want to incentivize them highly, and we'll talk about this. And monitor their performance like a hawk again. You know, when you put them into action, put them into motion, you got their compensation models going, you got them in the business, you're working them, really keep an eye on them the first 90 to 180 days. 
I mean, just every day, every week, look at them because that sets the tone for them going forward. If they know the boss is looking at them, they're going to try a little bit harder, and then you know if they're not going to work out because not every salesperson is going to work out. And try not to give them the benefit of the doubt. I mean, give them expectations, give them a quota, give them whatever you want done, make it happen, make sure they do it. More business development compensation stuff. Example one, you can do a base salary plus monthly bonus for goal achievement. Okay, these are, these are things that you've always heard about around the NARPM community, but I bring them up because I made a lot of mistakes in my business development hires. Uh, I can't go in it because, you know, I'm under legal obligation not to, but let's just keep going. Example two, pay him a flat fee. Pay him 300 bucks, for example, for each new management agreement they bring in. Is that high? Is that low? It's up to you. I'm just giving you an example. That could be 300 bananas, so I don't get in trouble here. All right, golden nuggets. Make a commitment to that person by paying them a base salary. Make it a livable amount, and then do a flat fee bonus. So, for example, in our office, we don't pay the bonus out until we get 10 homes a month. If they can't get 10 homes in a month with all the stuff we're, we're handing in front of them, they need to go. And I've got a two-pronged approach now with our business development. We have an inside guy who's doing all the social media, which I so love. I hate social media. You, if you know me, you know that. Social media, they, he does all the social media inside, and then the outside stuff, we've got a person to go out in the field and meet with folks. So we have a two-person approach, which is also a golden nugget. If you're going to have multiple salespeople, and or you're going to incentivize your team, make sure that everybody is on the same bonus structure. Keep it on the same bonus structure. Don't pay Billy Bob $100 and then pay the other person $200. Because where did that lead come from? How did that lead get signed up? Now you now you're, you know, have some animosity going on there. Right? So always try to pay them the same if possible. Supervise that business development manager. Uh, I wish I could do a good impersonation, but if you could sign up 100 homes, that'd be great. That'd be really great this month. But set a minimum production goal. Use a, and here's a challenge for it. Use a dollar count. Does it matter how many doors you manage, really? Or does it matter more for a dollar count? So I challenge you to establish a goal of a dollar count. Would you not rather have one big giant home to manage or three little itty bitty crappy homes to manage? Which would you rather have? So you, if you explain that and, and figure out the bonuses for your BDM, then you can go out and do it. Create achievable bonuses. Salespeople love bonuses. A true salesperson loves the carrot. Create something. Hey, man, if you sign up X number of homes this month, uh, I'll give you a gift card to Starbucks you know, or something, whatever that could be. I know that's pretty lame, but my point being is create a bonus for them. All right, next one. Ensure the BDM visits every home in person. That's a lesson learned, which is why that little bouncy thing does it. Uh, in the past, we've had business development person that would sign up a home never visiting the home in person. The portfolio manager gets out there and says, what the... What did you sign me up for? So I would have your BDM countersign every management agreement and make a note when they visited that home. Even if it's occupied by a tenant, they can still do a drive-by. If it's vacant, they should be able to do a walk-through, right? So I always challenge your business development person to walk every home if they can. If they can't do it, great, you know, but I'm just saying, you know, you run into problems if you start taking a blind units that you never walked near. And it doesn't have to be, again, it doesn't have to be a full-blown inspection. I'm just talking a walk around. If it's occupied, just do, yep, it's still there. It's not on fire. Great, we'll sign it up. Lessons learned from the mid-level phase. Hiring a business development person will make your growth soar, for sure. Incentivize everybody in their duty positions with surprise bonuses. Uh, I like surprise bonuses. I'm sure you like surprise bonuses. If you make a bonus a part of the compensation model every Christmas, for example, guess what they expect? Every Christmas, they expect the bonus. But if you walk up to one of your staffers and say, hey, you know, you're doing a great job. Here's, here's a $50, you know, $50 bill and a card that says I love you. Great job. Keep it up. That's going to mean more to them than a bonus at Christmas time. And millennials, you know, I don't know, I can't figure them out either, but they don't like money. They, you know, you can do all kinds of stuff with them. They, they want to... You know, give them, a, give them a video card or something. They go play video games and they'll be all, all working for you. Super hard. Incentive-based pay rewards, performance, either good or bad. This is what we built into our model. 
So we track our, com our complaints and our service levels. So how do we track it? A simple spreadsheet. I was talking to a gent here a little bit ago. You know, that came out of a health check from a company that is in my market. The health check was done, and the one thing that came out of it is you need to track your service complaints. Okay, simple. How do I do it? Start an Excel spreadsheet. You're going to be able to recognize trends that you can stop loss with. So if you're getting complaints that nobody's answering the phone, well, figure out a way to answer the phones. Nobody's returning voicemails. Then get rid of voicemail altogether. We have no voicemail. None. I saw people falling over over there. They're like, what? No voicemail? No voicemail. Hire additional staff ahead of your growth. So for a lot of us, the summer is the peak. And in San Antonio, it's very mild through the year. We have no snow. But let's say you're in a northern state, and you've got summer coming up. And your leasing cycle is between, you know, let's say, Memorial Day to Labor Day. You've got to really step up and hire ahead of that growth so you're not caught off guard during that peak leasing season. Because we have a you know 11th month leasing season really pretty much. I mean November's pretty slow, but some markets their leasing season is three months, and that's their window. So their bell curve is giantly steep. Make sure you staff ahead of that. Establish systems that remove you from being the epicenter. I can talk all day about this because I hate being the epicenter. I want to rebrand. I want to call myself uh, Screen Properties or something. I don't know anything but my name. Because everybody wants to talk to me. Everybody wants to reach the broker. I have an issue. I want to talk to the broker. Blah, blah, blah. Well, if you're, if you're building the systems in your, in your business, you can remove yourself from being the epicenter, not only from your clients and your tenants, but from your staff. If you empower your staff to answer their own questions, they will. So if a staff member comes to you, how would I handle that? And you just turn it right around them. Well, how would you handle that? Well, I would do this, this, and this. Great idea. Go ahead and execute this, this, and this. And off they go. Empower them. Give them the tools. You want to test it? Go on vacation. Go on vacation for a week. See how much you freak out. Okay, see how much they freak out. Then try for two weeks. Maybe two years. I don't know. <laughs> Something cool. I really dig this. Pay attention. Okay, snapshot postcard. This is really neat. It's an app. You put it on your phone your iPhone, your Android, whatever millennials carry nowadays, snapshot postcard. It turns a picture into a postcard. So you sign up, you buy credits, and so for, again, a postcard, meaning a physically hard actual postcard that goes in the mail. I brought a copy, it's in my, my kit over there. But the postcard, so bear with me, it, it gets better. You take a selfie in front of the home. So if you're at a business development appointment, a listing appointment, or just an inspection, take a selfie in front of the home, put that on your postcard, 30 seconds, gone. Is that cooler than a thank you card, or what? Okay, my business development guy, he goes to meet somebody at their home, gets done with the appointment, walks outside, takes a selfie in front of the home like that, sends him a postcard, three days later it arrives in the mail, and that is the coolest thing ever. Way better than our handwritten thank you card. Because it's a selfie. That's the modern era. It costs you like less than a dollar. It costs you less to do this than to get good stationery and then mail it via USPS. This costs less and it's way cooler. I may have to take a selfie with the crowd here and send it to myself. What do you think? So you, tape, you type in the note and address and you mail it via USPS. Okay, I've got to give that one to Dennis Youssef from the bdncoach.com.au. Dennis Youssef gave me that one, so I will give him props on that. All right, there's one of our more happy clients, as you can tell. When do you know it's time for a change? When you get clients like this. When you see complaints, lack of service, maintenance issues. I'm going to talk a lot about that. Staff turnover, and then, of course, you start losing accounts. It's panic time. What are we doing wrong? Why are these people leaving? Okay, operational design. Let's give you a quick tidbit here. There is no one way. And I've studied this in all different facets, between a portfolio model based, departmental based. The only thing that you want to hone in on is you want to provide a service that will delight your clients. That's the bottom line. However you get there, it makes no difference. Because there is no one right way to do this. And I'm stealing this from 40 years of experience from the Australians. Bob Walters is who I taught, uh, taught me that. Which works best for your team? That's what you want to know. 
All right, some more good stuff. Do the routine things and do them routinely well. Are you sending out rent to your owners every month on the dot on the day that you say you're going to do it? If you're not, you have issues. That's a routine thing that you have to do routinely well. Go heavy on the maintenance department. I mean go heavy staff. I mean go heavy on the staff. We had one person doing our stuff last summer and we were overwhelmed. So this summer we're going to go to make sure we have a one to one and a half people doing our maintenance organization. Not out there turning wrenches, I'm talking about organizing the maintenance calls because we use a lot of third party vendors, as you may. Challenge. Design a system for your single owner point of contact. Owners hate being passed on to 10 different people in your office. Three different people, five different people. Give them a single owner point of contact and they're going to love you for it. Go team, yay, long term growth phase. Our portfolio, our portfolio model based design, right about 400 homes we started to see, okay, we got to fix something. Okay, we, were, we had everybody doing nothing and nobody doing everything. So it really was kind of stuck in the middle. We had to figure something out. We went with a portfolio design. Our portfolio manager is now the single owner point of contact. A portfolio manager is a property manager. We just named it something fancy. Our portfolio managers earn 20% of the revenue. So when they add a home, they cheer. Bring it on. When they lose a home, they feel it. And we've broken it down. It ends up being like right at 20 $30 or more per month that that property manager loses for every home they lose. So it's in their best interest to keep those homes. They want renewals because we share revenue with them. Every, every renewal we get a renewal fee and we share that with the managers. So they want renewals. It's not just a tick the box to get their job done. If they don't get it, they don't get paid. Their interests are fully aligned with the landlord. I'm a big, firm believer in this. When you do something like this, you're putting them at the same level of the landlord. If there's no tenant, there's no management fee, there's no revenue share. You see my point? Okay, other key points. More tips. Create immediate reward incentives. Online reviews. Online reviews. Are you giving a reward to your staff for getting online reviews? I'm going to show you how. New business referrals. If they're bringing in new business for you, are you rewarding them somehow? Or are you just giving them a pat on the back? Thank you for bringing me this $10,000 lifetime value client. Here's a pat on your back. Give them something for that. Daily operations should run themselves at this point in a long-term growth. And you want to look for strategic partnerships, other brokers, vendors, lenders, fellow property managers to partner up in your market because you're all going to feed off each other. That's how it works. Other key points continued. Keep your staff happy. It's amazing, but, you know, according to Disney, and they did this whole big, long, you know, million-dollar study on what keeps their Disney staff happy, and it comes down to food. Food. You know, food. I guess they're, they're like the lions. you got to feed them. So we like to do a lot of food in the office. It could be uh, my new addiction, which is delivered cookies to our office. Oh, I love cookies, I, obviously. But deliver cookies or just food. You know, have a pizza day, have a, have a potluck or do something. You know, get your staff together. Food is a great epicenter for that. Measure and track everything. Big believer in this. We created a custom spreadsheet of our own that we use religiously. Uh, I bug my GM every 10th of the month. Where's my spreadsheet? Where's my spreadsheet? You know, I want to look through those numbers and see where we are. So we track everything. What gets measured gets managed, right? That's a big, long saying. Everybody's heard it. And another pet peeve of mine, do not let sales leak out the door. When your owners say it's time to sell, you need to be getting a referral for that or you need to be doing it yourselves. Do not let that leak out the door. Meaning, do not let that owner that you've been managing for five years go hire a Sally agent down the street. You should be, I can't, I can't say it. You should be looking in inward to say, how did I screw up? How did that owner that I've been managing for five years chase a 5% commission or X, per, X percent commission down the road to go list with Sally Struthers or whomever. Don't let that happen. Work on your owners constantly. You know, tell them, hey, I sell homes. I sell homes. We sell homes. We can sell your home. Tell them constantly you can do that because one day they're going to wake up and say, oh, I didn't know you could sell homes. I just gave the listing to Billy Bob from church. 
and you'll knock yourself for that. Uh oh. Woo! <laughs> what we did to ensure growth, we built a custom WordPress website, as I talked about, full of videos tailored to attract owners. Full of videos. If you don't do videos well, go to Fiverr and have somebody do a video for you. They have really good looking spokespeople that can do videos on Fiverr for like 150 bucks or less. It's amazingly cheap. Go there and do videos if you don't speak well on video. Adopt a full disclosure mindset. We have a full disclosure mindset on our website. Every form we use, everything we do is on our website. And we get owners that will call us up and say, I've read everything, I've watched all the videos, I'm ready to sign, how does this work? Okay, that's the benefit of that. Now I know you want to, there's people out there that are maybe of a different mindset that want the opportunity to talk to those owners. I want to sell them on my service. I want to upsell them. I want to get as much as I can from them. I think you're missing out. I think you're missing out. You don't even realize it. The millennials, the generation coming behind them, they don't want to talk to you. They want to see what's coming up, see what it costs, and sign up. That's what they want. Okay, are you being found on the line, right? I love that, on the line. That's so funny. Lead generation equals search engine optimization. We've talked about that briefly. Create value on your site. Is it worth for them to go there? Do free market estimates. They should be able to put in an address into your website, and somebody on your team should be able to send them a free market estimate. We think your home is worth between X dollars and X dollars. For a more in-depth consultation, let's set up an appointment, let's go over to your home, let's see it. That's what a free market estimate will do, it'll get you leads. Market updates, great opportunity for a blog or a video, do market updates. Adding value to your website. If it's just a business card on a website, that's boring. <coughs> Educate your consumer, great opportunity to tell your owners, yes, Mr. Owner, we do have to change the locks, here's why. Right? You could reference the property code. You know, you could, you could educate your owners on anything you want. The move-in process, the move-out process, when the rent comes, what are you doing on eviction, you know, why are you better than everybody else? You could educate your owners on those processes. Incentivize your staff to embrace the growth as we talked about. Be creative. Systems and procedures need to be simple and constant. Now, th this means a lot because as you grow, your systems will change, but you have to make them consistent because it's a personality thing, right? The property management company owners may have a little bit more of a high D, like me, versus your staffers may be more of a compliance, maybe more of the C, and they need that warm blanket of consistent procedures being done daily. They need that to feel good in their positions. You provide that for them, even if you change them, that's fine. If you provide that for them, they'll feel good about what they're doing. Give clients what they want, examples. Owners want one, point of contact. I've said it several times and I keep beating it into your heads, one point of contact is what they want. And tenants want an easy lease process. We talked about that at length. I am a firm believer in that. They really do. If you don't believe me, go rent a VRBO and then show up at 10 o'clock at some place to go to some key box four miles across town and then you gotta go back to the VRBO. That's frustrating, okay? Everybody wants to do a door-to-door -door move in. All right, some more tips. Record complaints, use a simple spreadsheet as we talked about. Maximize the revenue you can generate, do not fear fees. There's coaches out there that will help you fee maximize your business. And I can't get into it here, but I think that's a big part of what you wanna do. Survey your clients. I know, God, don't, I don't wanna hear what my owner has to say, right? Some of us, <laughs> you know, we have that mindset, but you have to spine up and survey your clients. And there's gonna be key points to when you wanna do that. You just lease an owner's home, right? That's a great opportunity. And how do you want to conduct the leases? This is a great technique to do, is you can physically have one of your staff members pick up a phone and call them, then record those results if you reach them into a SurveyMonkey net promoter score design. Record every one of those calls. Not like physically, like, you know, record the audio of it, but when they make that call and they reach the owner, record the results. That's going to generate a net promoter score for you. Use SurveyMonkey. Just lease the owner's home, they're happy, go lucky. Great time to get a video review as well. If you can get them on the phone, get them a video review, you can get them into your website and do that. There's techniques for it. Example two, a tenant just completed a work order. 
well, you responded in one day, and you were fabulous, and your maintenance tech showed up on time, and they were clean. I'm great. I'm happy with you guys. Thank you. Great time to call your tenants. Hey, was that work order completed? Because we use third-party vendors, and sometimes the story they tell us may not be the story that is the actual truth. Okay, so that's a good checks and balance for your vendors to ensure they did show up and complete that work order. And again, record those calls, the results of those calls, inside of SurveyMonkey. Build a net promoter score. Two best practices for, for providing great service. Tips. Review the statements. Duh. Review the statements before they go out. So, I think it's what, the 8th of the month? The, my GM's looking at me. The 8th of the month, we do, we do a dry run of portfolio manager statements for all the homes that they manage. The PMs sit down and go through every statement, line by line, to make sure that they're not getting hit with double charges, there's not double management fees, there's not anything wrong with those statements. Then they say, yep, they're good, and they bless off on it. Then they send those, we send money to the owner the next day with the statements. So run, do a dry run. If the PMs miss something, well, you can point the finger at them and say, you missed it, it's your fault, you gotta talk to the owner, you gotta schmooze them, and you gotta make it right. Tip number two, send customized Monday morning marketing reports. So all of our homes on the market, I think we have close to 50 right now, 40, 45, somewhere in there. Every Monday, the owners get a customized marketing report from us on the results of that week's actions. So we take a screenshot of the multiple listing service. We showed how many shares there were. It's going to show how many likes, how many dislikes, how many you know, interested, and it's also going to show how many showings they had. And that's going to go to the owner every Monday morning and copied to the portfolio manager. That's a great opportunity for the portfolio manager to piggyback on that, reply all, hey, Mr. Owner, it might be time for a price reduction. Just letting you know. Love you, bye. Okay? That's a great technique. Owners can never come back on you and say, I never heard from you. You listed the home on the market, and six weeks later, nobody ever called me, nobody ever contacted me. We do it every Monday. So owners get that every Monday, and it's a great way to get price reductions. Because you know well, the way we work, we don't necessarily control that. It is the owner's home, so we have to kind of give them a, a say at certain points. I think we all have that dilemma. Maintenance has an excellent point of difference. There's a high-speed super Dodge van. The, uh, the wings are underneath. They're really cool. You should see them. Some more tips. Keep name similar to your company name. If you're going to start a maintenance division, I recommend, I like, to keep the name as to what your company name is. If you want to call it you know, XYZ Maintenance and hide the LLC owner, eh, that's a little, I don't know, I don't feel good about that. Okay, so that's just my, my advice. Keep it small or go big. We're small. We have one truck, one maintenance guy, one director of maintenance, and an assistant. And the assistant does three other different things. So I really wouldn't even call them part of the maintenance department. Where I'm going is, last summer we got into two, three techs, and we're just in that middle ground, that no man's land that kind of got us stuck. So we scaled back, let a couple guys go, and now we just run with one truck and one van. Now there are some good company owners here that go big. And I would say pick one. Go small or go big. But you get stuck in the middle, it's not profitable. Not. Trust me from experience. Mid-level is no man's land, as I mentioned. And as I mentioned before, staff up. Staff up. Make sure that you have enough people to cover down on your maintenance requests and your follow-ups. It's okay if you miss something, but if you communicate that to your tenants, it's okay. They'll be okay with you, right? But if they hear nothing from you, that's when complaints start to happen. Google complaints start to happen. Yelp complaints start to happen. So staff up on your maintenance. It's going to do more for you to eliminate any bad stuff going on. Reputation management. All right, I am ready. You guys are going to have some fun learning some stuff about this one. Okay, reputation management. Establish an excellent Google Plus page. Google Plus equals SEO. If you haven't done this by now, you're probably, I don't know, you're, you're asleep. But Google Plus, you have to establish that part. Create a lot of videos. And trust me, guys, I, I'm, I'm getting to some good stuff, so bear with me. Create videos on YouTube. Videos can be move out inspections, annual policy changes, top 20 frequently asked questions. That's a good one. You could do a video on every one of your top 20 FAQs. 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, whatever it could be, that's a good one. You have 20 videos right there. 
marketing walkthroughs, monthly newsletter videos, case studies, blogs, teaching moments, market updates, bloopers. Okay, doesn't hurt. We have a standing order in the office every time a portfolio manager goes to a home, every time they do a video. And it could be 10 seconds or 10 minutes. That is proof that they were at the home. Video walkthroughs, 10 minutes, 15 minutes long, great, that's an easy one. But what about when they pick up the sign? They do a 10 second video. Hi, I'm here at the home and this is my name and blah, 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 okay, today looks great, done. Post that to YouTube, now you have another video proof that you were at the home. Because you ever had owners that say, you never go to the home? You ever have tenants say, well, you didn't cut the grass. Well, that video of the outside of the home shows you right then and there. And why not share that with the owner? They would love that. That 10 second video clip. Hey, Mr. Owner, I was at your home today. Everything looked great. I picked up the sign. The tenants are moving in tomorrow. Here's your video. Looks great. Think of the clout you're going to get from the owners on that. More tips. Owners choose their management company by the online reviews. Duh, hello, right? They do choose their management companies by the online reviews. Don't kid yourself. They do. Owners will even choose their portfolio managers. We incentivize our team to get us reviews. We ask them to be dropped by name. There's Melanie's name. And we've had owners call us and say, I saw Melanie's online review, and I want to work with Melanie, the portfolio manager. Where do I sign? Are you going to argue with them? <laughs> They're ready to go. OK, we have over 2,100 videos on our, our YouTube page. I think this is old news. I think we have about 2,500 now. We just keep adding them. That's good stuff. How to avoid the bad reviews. OK, I told you I was going to do some good stuff. This is, this is getting there. Monitor Yelp and Google and BBB and Angie's List and Facebook. Monitor all that. OK, good. Where do your bad reviews come from? Where are they coming from? Security deposits, a lot of times for us. OK, security deposit is going to be the issue. We implement a provider's feedback on your website. Give them a place to go to complain. Provide us feedback on your website. I'd rather go to my website than go on to Yelp. Because you know what? They can get on Yelp and say anything. I mean, anything about anything. And it, it, you look like it just doesn't look good if you go back and forth on Yelp too many times. You know, I don't have a perfect solution for that. But if we get a bad Yelp review, I would encourage an owner or a tenant to basically say, we encourage any owner or tenant to come find out more with us, contact us directly to find out the real story behind this review. Something along those lines. You diffuse it, you encourage them to contact you, because what are you going to get on there and say? You know, you're going to get on there and say, you know, he said and she said and point fingers at each other on Yelp? You just look bad. Survey your clients, tenants, and owners. We talked about that. Okay? Easy stuff. Survey your clients, tenants, and owners. This is what we always get, right? You charge me $10, I'm mad at you. I'm going to go online and trash you. You charge me $10, I hate you. Here's some tips. Provide over-the-top evidence in your itemization letters. And I'm talking about include video references with a link to the video. If you have a YouTube video, even as gobbledygook, right? Copy, paste, put it in your letter. That's going to go out to the tenant. We have to send a hard copy letter to our tenants. That's, you know, Texas law. Okay, we also name the video inspectors. So a video taken by X person on X date, here's her name. And we also name any other people. So if there is a third party inspection done, which we do a third party inspection with pros, one of our good vendors, we name the inspector. So we have references. We all learned that in school. If you're going to go and write a term paper, you've got to have references. Well, this is it. This is how you do it. This is going to reduce the number of complaints by providing them with overwhelming evidence. Give the outgoing tenant a regimen way to refute. So if they are really mad about it, direct them. If you want to dispute this, you go to a website, you fill out a form, you, can, you add in the evidence, okay? Don't just tell them to email you. Make them fill out a form. Make them provide evidence to you. This is going to eliminate those BS things. Well, you know, I, I'm mad at you because you charged me a carpet cleaning, and, but I don't have a receipt, right? So they have to, have to bring those with proof. Ask for pictures and documented evidence. Require that form to be filled out. Okay, if you get that form in, that's where you can go to a committee, and I would recommend splitting the difference. You know, what's more expensive, a $10,000 lawsuit over 100 bucks, or just giving them 50 bucks back and say, have a nice life? You know, at some point, you gotta give some. You never 
want to go to a courtroom. You never want to go to a courtroom. Even if your owner says, I don't care, take him to court, you never want to go there. All right, the big one. If you have one of those tenants that is just completely over the top, will never let it go, have an attorney that you work with, draft up a templated go-away letter. The attorney will say something to the effect, I've reviewed everything, I've reviewed all the evidence, all this falls within the lease agreement, all this falls within property code, have a nice life, go away. We have that templated letter, I think it costs us $25 per letter from the attorney, 10 minutes of his time. If you have that ready to go, for those tenants that are over the top, will never let it go, it may help you. It's a good technique. How to get the good reviews. All right, rack cards. We have rack cards in our office for Google and Yelp reviews, and here's the kicker. You have to incentivize your staff by getting, them to, getting your reviewers to drop their name. You cannot incentivize somebody to leave you a review, but you can incentivize your staff to get a review and have their name dropped. This is legit, I've looked it up. Google and Yelp will allow this. So this is what we do. We have a nice rack card in our office and we even give them instructions. Hey dummy, go on Google and do this. How to get realtor referrals. Uh, we created a flat fee referral. So around the realtor community, we all know the 20%, X% percent referral fee, we all get that. Tell me what that is to a management fee. Hey man, I'll give you 20% if you can bring me a, a property manager customer. You're like, what the heck is that? I don't know what that is. So you create a flat fee. We created a program, 555. Real easy to remember. I did 555 because my competitors were doing 500. <laughs> so I went up, you know, 55 bucks. So we created that. We have a rack card in the office. We promote it everywhere. And then we also want to find strategic partners to get those referrals, meaning other brokers that may not be doing property management, we want to find those folks. How to get owner referrals. Okay, this is a, this is a golden nugget. Um, we've been, uh, we've been um, struggling with this for a long time. And some of you may have the same issue. So in the state of Texas, we can only give somebody $50 for any sort of incentive to bring us management, fee refer management referrals, right? So if your owner, hey, Mr. Owner, I'll give you 50 bucks if you can bring me a management referral. And they're gonna say, whatever. Right? And I cannot give them three months of management or six months of management. We can't do that in Texas. It's too gray. I could argue with the state that says, yeah, we could do that, but I don't want to raise my head out of the foxhole and get it shot off. So what we've decided to do, golden nugget time, we created a referral partnership charity. We created a referral partnership charity. We're using Warrior's Heart, the Warrior's Heart Foundation. So bear with me. I'm going to get to this. For every property management client referral, we will donate $500 to the Warriors Heart Foundation. That's an excellent way to get referrals. We're getting also ready to double down with the vendors. So it's only $500 right now. I'm happy to give that away for every property management referral that we get. But if you can get with your vendors and say, hey, would you give 100 bucks for every referral we get? And you can get five vendors to do this, now you can double down on that and make that 1000 bucks. What if you get a vendor that says, I'll give you 250 or 500 Now you can make that $1,500. Okay, it gets better. You can post this to your website. You can post on social media. Imagine the social media clout from doing that. Imagine that. Man, I just, I'm so excited to talk about it. You can present this to new owners at sign up. And after donation, you can get video, you can get written proof. And you can put that in the owner's name, the referring owner's name. You can share that with everybody in the entire world, all on social media. Imagine the clout you're going to get from that, that you made a donation to a worthy charity. Now, we chose Warrior's Heart because it's an awesome, awesome deal. They're, they're working with military, law enforcement, and first responders to specialize in the treatment of chemical dependency and PTSD. So these are folks... We're giving money on behalf of owners for a property management referral to go to this organization, veterans and first responders. So it's a, it's a really a great deal. I talk more about it on a podcast show, and I'm going to talk with you a little bit here about that. Okay, wake up. It's metrics time. <laughs> Batman, slap you. Okay, I, can't go, I want to go back to that again. Warrior's Heart. If you're interested in doing something similar with Warrior's Heart, you can go to their website. You can contact them. They will help you template this for your business. 
They will help you put this into your business. They'll provide you marketing materials. They'll provide you slicks. They'll help you do whatever you want to do or can do, do the same thing in your business. We can't add, we can't pay management company refer, management referrals to owners. We can't do it in Texas. But I can give to charity and put it in that owner's name and then social media, the you know what out of it out there. That's what's going to give you some real, real feedback. Okay, wake up metrics time. Start and maintain keeping good metrics. I think we all should be doing that. Here's a good one. Prepare your business to sell now. Has anybody ever thought of that? You think, hey, I'm going to be running this thing for 30 years. But if you prepare your business to sell now, it's going to make you better. It's going to make sure that you identify things that you need to improve right this second. Bookkeeper, CPA, keep great books. If you're keeping great books, that prepare to sell is going to make it a lot easier on your life. I really recommend going through the CRMC checklist. Go through that CRMC checklist. Even if you don't have the RMP and the PMP and the NPM and the alphabet soup you need, go through that checklist. That is a playbook to get your business ready to sell. That is your checklist to get your business ready to go. And you're going to identify things in there that, hey, I should have a written policy. I should be doing that. That's good stuff. I need to implement that. Okay, key measuring tools. One of the ones we always use, total number of units, managed and gross revenue. We talked about that. Management fee revenue per door, managed per month. Here's my goal, right? Jumping across the goal. $200 per door per month. That's what you want as a goal for each home that you manage. Additional revenue generated per $1 management fees. I would say you're going to want 50 cents in sundry revenue for every dollar of management fees you're generating. That could be high, but that's a great target. On average, I would say most of the crowd here is maybe 25 cents. That's excluding leasing fees. Okay, I'm talking sundry extra revenue. All the other stuff that's out there. Percent of staff expense to revenue. I want to keep it under 50%. And that goes for every level of management company. Your small, medium, large. We did this drill three years ago with Tony Drost. He did all the work. He compiled all the small, medium, large companies in 2014. We were, he was up here doing this. And that's what it came down to. It was sometimes 45%. It was sometimes 55%. But in the, in the vicinity of 50% was always kind of the benchmark of where you want to keep it. Profit margins, you want to probably be around 20% or more. If you're below that, you're running a little thin. Okay? If you ever had the need to sell and you're not running a 20% profit, you're going to be, that's going to be tough. Okay? All right, some more. Annual losses. Stay under 15%. The national average is 15% annually. We had, I think, 122 losses last year, right? And we keep track of bad losses, neutral losses, and good losses. What's a bad loss? You and an owner get crossed and you guys say, we're parting ways, we're done. Goodbye. A neutral loss is when an owner sells with Sally, the realtor, who's their cousin. Okay, you, you didn't really screw up, but you didn't really, it wasn't good. It didn't feel good. And then, of course, a good loss would be as if you sell the home or the owner potentially moves back in and they're all happy with you. That could be a good loss. Let's subtract those losses. Hey, we were at 20% last year. Okay, we were at 20%. Because the San Antonio market is super hot. So unfortunately, we lost a lot because you get those reluctant landlords that get wind of the market being hot and they say, I want to sell. And those things were going like crazy last year. Business development expense. You want to keep that at a max of your 10% your gross annual revenue. And that's probably high. It may want to be more towards 6 to 8% of your max gross annual revenue for business development. Now you can pick and choose what you want to consider that to be for you. That could be only salaries, right? That could be everything, everything. That could be pay-per-click, that could be websites, that could be everything going towards business development. It's up for you to decide, but that 10% figure, I've done the math, which way, all the different ways, and that's what I think is a good one to be healthy. Okay, exit strategy. Start planning an exit today, as I mentioned. It makes you review your business from top to bottom. You go through that drill of the CIMC checklist, Prepare your company books for a pre-diligence. All right, we all heard the term due diligence. Well, this is a pre-diligence. So maybe you want to sit down with your bookkeeper and your CPA and say, I want to prepare my books 
as if somebody were going to walk in here and make me a written cash offer today. If you're prepared for that, then you just made your next 20 years that much easier. Because you want to build the systems in place now to prepare yourself to sell 20 years from now. Okay? I'm telling you, you're going to, you're going to see some amazing things. Identify and correct those weaknesses as you identify them with that CRMC checklist. Okay, some resources. We do have a podcast show, and I'm the host. <laughs> so, good thing is, as I've been told, I have a good face for radio, so that's excellent. <laughs> I would recommend checking out our Property Management Mastermind podcast show. And where I got this idea is several years ago, as I started coming to these broker owner conferences, I would meet somebody. We'd have a brief conversation. We'd exchange business cards. We'd say, hey, let's set up a call for next month or next week or whatever. You get back to your office. You set up a call. And all you're doing is trading best practices, right? And that's, I, would, I would just wish we could have recorded some of those because those were golden. I picked up all kinds of good stuff from those calls. And I think by putting it on a podcast like this, you're going to have the opportunity to get those golden nuggets. I've got some good guests on there. And maybe there's some more out here in the crowd that want to join. But essentially what we're doing is getting information out to property management company owners. So you're going to really benefit from that podcast show. Okay, so if you want to copy these slides, if you want a metrics tracking spreadsheet, if you want business development advice, if you want to talk about tenant liability insurance, if you want to review us online, review us online, you know, I have to, maybe I'll jump. If you want to review us online, we're happy to reciprocate. You don't have to tell everybody I was your favorite you know, landlord or like you were a tenant. Tell everybody you had a good time at the presentation in Vegas. Yelp is my first choice. If you give us a Yelp review, we're glad to reciprocate. Mic drop. Okay. That's a joke. Here are the resources. Okay. Any questions? Should I go back to this one? You guys liked that one, didn't you? Mic drop. Walk away. I wish I could, but I don't want to hurt this. All right, here's the resources again. Any questions? I think we're doing pretty good on time. We have 11.43. We're going until at least 1 o'clock, right? I get to stand up here and say, Bueller, Bueller, Bueller. Oh, we have one in the back. I think there's a microphone. If you want to grab the mic, I hope those are working. Happy to find some more questions. We have plenty of time. You're going to get bored at lunch, I'm telling you. Company for the videos is, I would recommend, virtually incredible. Virtually incredible. Oh, Fiverr. Yeah, it's Fiverr. F I V E R R. I don't believe I have it up there. No. But if you just look for Fiverr online, there are virtual assistants that can do pretty much anything for you. I love them. They'll rewrite your management agreements if they want, they'll record videos for you, they'll do voiceovers. They couldn't do anything about my hairline, but. You know, what can you do? Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. No voicemail. Good question. So the question was, how do you do no voicemail? So essentially, you make it a dead end, right? So you have a prompt. It says, hi, thanks for calling, blah, blah, blah. We're open from here. Unfortunately, we don't have voicemail. So to get in touch with us, email us at info wherever you want to go, OK? Encourage them to email you. Voicemails get missed. Voicemails don't get returned on time. I don't like them. Nobody likes to listen to them. I, hate, I don't even like listening to them on my phone, like my iPhone. So if you can eliminate voicemail and it fits your business, I'd recommend doing it. Question, sir. How many DMs do you have? Good question. So he wanted to know how many business development staff we have, and he wanted to know if that 10% threshold is encompassing everything. So what we have designed, after trials and tribulations of going through some bad hires, we developed an inside business development person on a minimum base salary with a bonus, and an outside business development person that goes out in the field and meets the people face to face. 
So between those two, we have two staffers on salary with bonus incentives, and their combined efforts, along with some other marketing efforts, you know, pay-per-click ads and SEO options and you know, video optimizations, all that combined is still going to be right at eight to ten percent of that threshold. So I think we're accomplishing that, and I think we can do what we set out to do because we've already had 25 plus months already this year. So we can we can get to 300 this year. It just depends on what the market's going to let us do to net. How many are we going to net? Right? We can add 300 and lose 200. Well, you're okay. You can see the pain there, and it might be that way. All right. Next question. Ken. We have enough leads to keep both the business development person and basically give them as many leads as they can handle. That free market estimate has been killer. We'll get three, four, or five leads in a weekend, and usually one to two a day just from the free market estimates. But remember, you have to produce on that service. You have to have somebody produce the free market estimate for you in-house. My inside guy does that with a very templated, uh, custom free market estimate, which is a great place to put ads in, by the way. You can put plugs in for your company, you can put ads in there, and you send that out to your owners, and it looks good, and they give them a range. Don't give them an X dollar. And the rent range thing, uh, I think that's really cool. We just haven't played with it much. So we get all of our information from the multiple listing service. So we're kind of in a unique market, as the MLS is the end all be all for rental comps. Let's go on the right this time. Yes, yes ma'am. Good question. Good question. I would not know how you would do that for your business, but we did. what we did is we created a portfolio management model, and that portfolio manager is a single owner point of contact for that owner that they represent. In a, in a hybrid, in a departmental-based system, that's a tough one. I don't know how you would do that, which is why we went to portfolio management-based systems. But as you grow, I'm, let me say this again, uh, through 100 to 400 homes, we were kind of all over the place. You know, we were everybody doing everything and nobody doing anything, and it was, it was really kind of a bad situation. And we had that departmental-based system. We had one person doing leasing. We had one person doing maintenance. We had one person doing other stuff. And the owners never knew who to call. So we created a system through the portfolio management model to give them one person to contact. Hopefully that answers that question. Yes, sir. Yeah, outsourcing bookkeeping. So you have to potentially find a local source. And what we did is we found a local source next to our office, ironically, that they were able to do the bookkeeping for us. And we pay them 45 bucks an hour. And I think they went up to 55. So they went up to 55 bucks an hour, but you can be amazed what they can knock out at $55, $55 an hour. So over the year, we're going to spend roughly eighteen dollars to $20,000 for bookkeeping services. Would you rather spend eighteen? dollars or hire somebody in-house for 40. You know, that's, that's kind of a dumb question, right? We'd all like to be able to have outsourced books. So look around your local market. I guarantee you there's somebody that can do the books, if not another market, because there's no reason they have to be next door to you. They could be in wherever. You know, there's no reason they can't be anywhere else. Hopefully that answers that question. Yes, sir. I have two questions. One, Yeah, great question. So, uh, as I mentioned, I was doing a podcast episode yesterday. I dropped uh, a lady's name named Deb Newell. Maybe some people know Deb here. She and I had a conversation a couple years ago, and she reminded me that the truest definition of a portfolio manager is one that does everything, right? They do everything. Well, that's not what we do. So, the leasing is done 
specialized in-house. The maintenance, we have a director of maintenance, okay? And those two functions are kind of on the outside of what the portfolio manager does. But they are monitoring both. You know, they're calling the owner on that new lease agreement. Hey, Mr. and Mrs. Owner, we have a, a new application in. They look good. They meet the criteria. We're going to go ahead and rent to them. Just want to let you know, okay, love you, bye. And maintenance is the same thing. Maintenance may be calling that owner, but the portfolio manager is aware of what's going on with that home. Because if there's some bounce back and forth, I mean, at that point, the portfolio manager is being, you know, they're, they're being the, the person that is, is uh, the go-between, you know. But if there's a question on a statement, or if there's a question about a maintenance issue, or there's a question about the tenant, or there's a question about the lease or the renewal or selling, they go to that portfolio manager, and they know who to go to. They have a cell phone, they have an email, and if they don't go there, that's, that's, you know, that's kind of on them. We tell them over and over and over, go to the portfolio manager. No, no, it goes back to one of my key statements is do whatever it takes to delight your owners. You have to provide a service that delights your owners. And we've changed, we've gone from zero homes where it was just me to now we have 15 full-time employees. So it really kind of depends on your organization and what they all do. And we outsource as much as we can. Okay. Yep, you're welcome. Yes, sir. Right, so the no voicemail thing. All right, let's, let's dig into it further. You call my office right now, it's gonna go to one person. If they miss it, it's gonna roll to a second person, and then it goes to a call answering service during the business day. We have a call answering service. And I'll drop the name, it's called Pat Live. It goes to Pat Live during the business day. And they take a written message. It's not a voicemail. It's an actual live person taking a message from that particular caller, then they email that to our company and then we handle it back from there. So we have no voicemail during the duty day, and then after that, there's, it's like a dead end. It says, thank you for calling. The system doesn't allow you to leave a voicemail. If you have any questions, concerns, call us back or leave us an email. That's how you do that. Did that answer that question? Yes. Awesome. Yes, sir. So for your portfolio managers, uh, two questions. One, how many properties do they normally manage um, in the current system? And then are you paying them salary plus a bonus for the amount of properties that they are managing? Great point. So on the portfolio manager compensation, we give them a base salary of 24. And that's just to kind of keep them alive as we build up their portfolio. Once they cross over to roughly, let's say 100 homes, 110 homes, that's when they start to generate more in their revenue. So it's, it's door number one or it's door number two. It's not both. You know, here's your minimum. You're going to walk away with 24K a year. And then once you get into, let's say, over 100 plus homes, you're going to be making more in revenue share. And I think they can manage, you know, our highest one is at 175 right now. I think they can go up to about 250. I think each portfolio manager can manage about 250 homes without going crazy in the summer because they might have 30, or 30 homes to go on the market first of June. You know, it can be that crazy. So that's where my limit is with them. And we're looking at ways to pull low yielding tasks away from them. Windshield time is a low yielding task for a portfolio manager. You want them returning emails, making emails, returning phone calls, calling people. That's what you want them doing. Driving them all over the city for a five minute walkthrough is maybe not the best use of their time. So we're looking at ways to insource those particular actions, the low fruit, such as the walkthroughs and the inspections. You know, we can outsource it, but we're paying too much, so we're potentially going to insource that. Yes, ma'am, question. Probably last question. Um, we're trying to transition from the departmental to portfolio, and the one uh, speaking with it that we ran into is, was maintenance. Uh, the constant back and forth between the portfolio manager calling the maintenance department, what does this mean, how do I explain it to the owner, and they call the owner, and then the owner has a question, and the portfolio manager has to say, I'm sorry, let me get back to you on that, call the maintenance department, get more information, and we've got this, this big waste of time Right, so we do hone in on the single owner point of contact for the maintenance back and forth question and answer session. If necessary, put the maintenance director in touch with the owner and they can work out the issues directly. If the owner has a question about something along those lines a week from then or two weeks from then, 
then they can contact that single owner point of contact. I don't want my PMs to be go-betweens on passing messages because they can never tell the story the same way the director of maintenance can. Does that make sense? Right, it's a challenge. It's an internal challenge you're going to have. I, we can talk more offline. Correct. And they may need, you may have to put them in touch with the vendor. I mean, what if it's a real complicated air conditioning issue? You may want to put the owner in touch with that vendor so the vendor can tell them exactly what's going on versus the vendor telling the maintenance director, telling the portfolio manager, telling the, you see where I'm going? Yeah, you're welcome. What's a uh, 600 divided by 15? Yeah, sounds good. Provide a service that will delight your clients. Provide a service that will delight your clients. It doesn't matter what the ratio is. What matters is your EBITDA, what's your profits, what's your gross revenue, how many homes you're managing, are you doing a service, are you growing? Those are the big things. Don't worry about the ratio so much with the, with the number of personnel versus the number of homes. If you're, if you're losing sleep about that at night, you're missing the big picture. Okay, I'm being kicked off. All right, thank you everybody, I appreciate it. <laughs>